I have uh, several announcements to make. First, I want to say a word in behalf of Radio Free Europe, which is now making its annual appeal for support from all our citizens. For more than 10 years, this enterprise has been reaching out to people in Europe, Eastern Europe, with truth and devotion to liberty as its message. While this radio is at work, with listeners numbering in the millions, the competition of ideas in these countries is kept alive. The individual Americans, by giving to Radio Free Europe, may be sure that they are bringing a beacon of light into countries to which millions of us are tied by kinship and whose hope for freedom all of us must share. This is a peaceful concern, but a firm one. Radio Free Europe needs and deserves our generous help. Secondly, Mrs. Kennedy and I are giving an afternoon reception at the White House next Monday for the Latin American ambassadors to the United States, the Council of the OAS, as well as members of Congress concerned with Latin American affairs. I will take the opportunity at the close of the reception to make a major statement of some of my views about the problems of the Americas. Third, pursuant to my instructions, each federal department and agency has renewed its procurement and construction plans for the remainder of the current fiscal year through June 30th, 1961, for the purpose of speeding up its contracts and purchases with available funds. The total of obligations for the remainder of the fiscal year is now planned to be $660 million higher than before the directive. If this acceleration proceeds as planned by the agencies, direct federal purchases of goods and services will be increased in the January-March quarter by an annual rate of about one quarter of a billion dollars, and in the April-June quarter by an annual rate of about three quarters of a billion dollars. Next, I wish to announce that the Prime Minister of Sweden, Mr. Erlanda, will make an informal visit to the United States for a period of 10 days, beginning March 28th. The Prime Minister and I will meet on, together on the 29th, after which Mr. Erlanda will visit other parts of the United States. I'm very pleased with the prospect of meeting the Prime Minister, for we Americans have many close ties with Sweden and its people, and I extend a most hearty welcome to him. It's been brought to my attention next that 5,000 Indian and Eskimo children under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior are not in school and cannot attend school until facilities are built for them. These children live on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona and New Mexico, in Alaska, and on the Choctaw Reservation in Mississippi. In addition, other thousands are housed in overcrowded and obsolete boarding and day facilities, some hazardous to their health and safety. I have instructed the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Udall, to submit to the Congress without delay plans to correct this situation. I'm announcing the appointment and scheduled departure this evening of a special mission to review the status and effectiveness of United States economic policies in Bolivia. The chairman of the three-person mission is Dr. Willard Thorpe, and the other two members are Mr. Jack Corbett, Mr. Seymour J. Rubin. This mission will arrive in La Paz on March 9th and spend approximately two weeks before returning to Washington to report their recommendations for a plan of action to be followed by United States agencies in Washington and Bolivia. An advisor to the mission, Mr. DeCour, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs, has already arrived. And the, finally, I want to say that in response to the first executive order, the number of people receiving surplus food has doubled from 3,500,000 in December to 6,100,000 at the present time. The value of the food being distributed monthly has doubled. $12.80 before the expanded program went into effect, $24.40 in retail value at the present time. In addition, this has doubled the protein value of the direct distribution of food. And this is the last statement. The Cuban Red Cross, the American Red Cross, and U.S. Navy today combined in a three-way effort to combat a polio breakout in Guantanamo City, Cuba, some 31 miles from the naval base. Earlier today, the Red Cross director at the U.S. Naval Base in southeastern Cuba 
had a phone call from a male Red Cross nurse in Guantanamo City saying there was an outbreak of polio with three children dead and ten more stricken. All available vaccine had been used by the hospitals in Guantanamo City, and aid was needed to give vaccine to at least 100 more children, which they were unable to obtain. The Red Cross director at the base got permission from Admiral Edward J. O'Donnell to send all the vaccine which could be spared. She carried and sent enough vaccine for 160 first inoculations to the Northeast Gate, where she met the Cuban Red Cross ambulance where the transfer was made. I want to take this opportunity and this incident to emphasize again that our difference of opinion on matters affecting Cuba are not with the Cuban people. Rather, we desire the closest and harmonious and friendly and most sympathetic ties with them. Mr. President, uh, you told us last month that you expected to have an answer from the Defense Department about this time on whether there is or is not a missile gap. Are you able to say at this time whether there is or is not? We are concluding our review of the recommendations which the Defense Department has made for changes in the defense budget. I'm hopeful that uh, this survey can be completed in the next few days, and then we plan to send the results of our study uh, to the uh, Congress. And at that time, we'll indicate what I believe to be the relative defensive position of the United States and other countries and what needs to be done to improve it. Mr. President, uh, I'm sure you're aware, sir, of the tremendous mail response that your news conferences on television and radio has produced. Uh, there are many Americans who believe that in our manner of questioning or seeking your attention, uh, that we're subjecting you to some abuse or a lack of respect. I wonder, sir, in this light, could you tell us generally your feelings about your press conferences today and uh, your feelings about how they're conducted? Well, your subject me to some abuse, but not to uh, any lack of respect, I don't think. <laughs> I must say that uh, I do uh, know that uh, there are difficulties. Uh, but if, uh, and I know that it pr places burdens on members of the press to have to stand up, particularly when I'm not able to recognize them. On the other hand, if it were changed uh, and one member stood up, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, that would not be a satisfactory uh, device. So that uh, I think that uh, along with the old uh, saying about don't take down a fence so you know why it was put up, I would say that we should stay with what we now have. The approach to a peaceful settlement in Laos seems to have uh, run into a dead end with rejection by two of the proposed members of the Three Nation Mutual Commission. And the Soviet Union apparently still insists upon the approach of an ICC action there and, a, and an international conference. I wonder if in your review of the situation you've reached any conclusions as to what step the United States should now take to avoid uh, the expansion of the war in Laos. Well, the United States uh, had been hopeful that uh, it would be possible to set up uh, some uh, procedures where uh, neutral nations could uh, guarantee the uh, security of Laos and uh, also isolate it from uh, military pressures on both sides. The, uh, we're going to have to consider what uh, other procedures might be followed to achieve that goal. But this is a matter now of uh, discussion with uh, our friends and uh, with others, and I'm hopeful that uh, we can achieve a result which will bring uh, stability to Laos permit it to maintain its independence, uh, bring peace to the area, and uh, uh, self-determination. Those are very difficult goals to achieve, given the situation which we found uh, upon uh, assuming our responsibilities. But we are going to continue, and are now continuing, to take every step that we can to achieve that goal. Uh, Mr. President, there's been considerable comments, sir, that your program up to now has illustrated what the country can do for the people. I think a lot of people have asked me, and I'm asking you, sir, at what point does your program tell what the people can do for the country? Well, we are trying to do something in some of these programs. We're trying to do uh, two or three things on the domestic program. We're trying to uh, protect and uh, provide uh, for the jobs for people. I don't, uh, that is, I should think, a matter of concern to all Americans. 
and we are uh, committed to that goal. And the programs which we have sent up to the Hill have that object in mind. We are also uh, trying to strengthen our educational system, which needs to be strengthened over the long uh, period in which uh, we're going to be uh, tested. And we are trying to provide for a more orderly and effective uh, program of medical care for the elderly. Now, these programs, in my opinion, are in the public interest, and they're being assessed in that regard. I would say, as I've said from the beginning, that uh, in time, I have no doubt that all of us will find ourselves uh, tested in our attempts to maintain the independence of the United States and the independence of those countries to which we're committed. These programs are an attempt to provide for a viable economy, which I think is essential for the security of the United States and for the security of those countries which are dependent upon it. It's also an effort to provide equality of opportunity to the extent that at least uh, we can do so for all Americans. So I think that it's in the public interest. Uh, so could you help to clarify the aid to private schools issue? The National Defense Education Act passed in 1958 provides loans for private and elementary um, secondary schools uh, for equipment. And existing provisions, as well as your recommendations, allow for construction loans for private colleges. Uh, I wonder if you'd give us your view on proposals to add to your school bill provisions for loans as differentiated from grants for private and parochial elementary and secondary schools. Well, you've mentioned three rather different programs which involve different uh, uh, purposes and different constitutional problems. The first program was the National Defense Education Act, where loans were provided for uh, non-public schools for specific purposes languages, I believe, and also for science and engineering. I think $20 million was provided, which, interestingly enough, only about $1,300,000 has been used for loans. That's the, that was the uh, first. Now, the second uh, type of program you discuss, uh, in my, I supported that program. In my opinion, there was, uh, there was not uh, evidence as yet that that suggests a serious constitutional problem because it's tied very closely to national defense. The second uh, program we're talking about are loans to all colleges, and in my opinion, uh, and also, of course, scholarship assistance to the students. That is in a different position, at least to the best of my uh, judgment, from uh, uh, secondary education. Secondary education is compulsory. It is provided for every student, every citizen. Uh, every citizen must attend school. We are providing a program, which we've sent to the Congress, of grants for uh, public schools. And uh, therefore, in my opinion, uh, uh, that is the program which I hope will be passed. Now, the problem of loans to secondary education does institute uh, serious uh, constitutional problems. I don't think that anyone can read the Everson case without recognizing that uh, the position which the court took, minority and majority, in regard to the use of tax funds for non-public schools raises uh, serious constitutional questions. I've expressed uh, my view on them. I think the Congress should consider carefully uh, what its view is on them and what kind of programs it wants to recommend in this area. The Congress, as I say, has recommended uh, grants to private colleges in the past. I, I used, I think, uh, a week or two ago, I gave that as an example. It has used in the Defense Education Act, it's used loans for specific purposes. Whether across the board loans would be constitutional is the question which I have which uh, I think, uh, which in my opinion raises a serious constitutional question. Now, I'm hopeful that the Congress will enact grants. If the Congress and congressmen wish to address themselves to the problem of loans, which is a separate matter, we're not talking about in this bill loans to secondary education, and I'm hopeful it would be considered as a separate matter, that the Congress will consider the constitutional problems and then consider what action they would want to take, and we will be glad to cooperate in every way. But I am hopeful that while that consideration is being given that we will move ahead with the grant program. Are you suggesting, Mr. President, that Congress, <coughs> if it wants to uh, provide for long-term low-interest loans for private and parochial schools, ought to have a separate bill? Or well, I definitely believe that uh, we should not tie the two together. I think that there are sufficient constitutional questions which the members of Congress will have to consider uh, that uh, I believe that uh, in view of the fact that this act is directly 
in its title and in its purpose directed to giving grants to public schools that we should proceed with that bill. Now, any other matter, I think, seems to me, should be taken up as a separate issue if we want to then discuss loans. I have given my view of the constitutional problems involved in across-the-board loans. I've, as the questioner indicated, there have been some kinds of loans to non-public schools which uh, have been supported by the Congress and signed by the President and about which no constitutional problem has yet been raised, and the National Defense Education Act is the best example. But across-the-board loans, as, as uh, this uh, group know, this matter was not brought up in the last... Uh, President Eisenhower sent several messages to the Congress uh, dealing with federal aid to education. I believe there were one or two times when it was voted upon in the House. I do not recall that uh, there was a great uh, effort made at that time to uh, provide across-the-board loans to uh, an aid to education bill. The only time in my knowledge that it was brought up was by at the end of the last session in August by Senator Morse, and then just in the Senate. But uh, it was not to made a matter of great uh, interest at that time, and uh, I am uh, concerned that it should not be made an issue now in such a way that we end up the year with, again, uh, no uh, aid to secondary schools. Mr. President, you said last week, as I recall it, that uh, there was no room for debate about this matter. About right? grants. There's no room for debate about grants. There's obviously room for debate about loans because it's been debated. My view, however, is that the matter of loans is, uh, to the best of my knowledge and judgment, though this has not been tested by the courts, of course, in the sense that grants have been. But by my reading of the constitutional judgments in the Everson case, my judgment has been that across-the-board loans are also unconstitutional. Does that suggest you would veto a bill that provided for across-the-board loans, Mr. President? I think I've made my view very clear. I think it's always a mistake before we even have legislation to talk about what I'm going to do. But I think it's very clear about what my view is of grants and loans across the board to uh, 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 non-public schools. Now, colleges are in a different category. Specific programs of grants, even to colleges, which are non-public, have been supported by the Congress and signed by the President. Uh, loans and even grants to secondary education, under some circumstances, might be held to be constitutional. But across the board, to all non-public schools, my opinion does raise a serious constitutional question, which after reading the cases and giving it a good deal of thought, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, at least to my judgment, would be unconstitutional. Now, the, the President has an obligation in the Congress to consider this matter very carefully. I'm extremely sympathetic to those families who are paying their taxes for public education and also sustaining the rights of their, uh, sustaining their children in non-public schools. They carry a heavy burden. But I have made my position very clear for many months and have to make my position clear now, at least as long as I'm here, on what I believe to be the constitutional problem. And I also point out that this matter was not made an issue in uh, recent years until this time, except in the case of the very uh, amendment offered at the end of the last session by Senator Morse, which was just offered in the Senate and was not often in the House of Representatives, to the best President, of my knowledge. Mr. President, you've yes. taken executive action in the field of civil rights. Do you feel there's a need now for legislation in this area? And if so, do you plan to offer any at this session? When I believe that we can usefully move ahead in the field of legislation, I will recommend it to the Congress. I do believe that there's a good deal of things we can do now in administering laws previously passed by the Congress, particularly in the area of voting, and also by using the powers which the Constitution gives to the President uh, through executive orders. When I feel that there's necessity for a congressional action with a chance of getting that congressional action, then I will recommend it to the Congress. Uh, you uh, uh, and the Democratic Party are on record in opposition to the changing of Indian treaties without the consent of the Indians. The Army engineers are about to build a huge Kanzua Dam on the Upper Allegheny River, which will flood a third of a Western New York Indian reservation in direct <coughs> violation of a treaty that was signed by George Washington with the Seneca Indians. Have you any inclination at all to halt that project in favor of the so-called Morgan alternate project, which would not violate the treaty? Uh, I'm, uh, my uh, recollection that this matter has been tested in the courts, has it not? Yes, it has. The Supreme Court has upheld it. Uh, well, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not 
I have no plans to interfere with that uh, action. But, uh, on the assumption that uh, Mr. Thompson has by now caught up with Mr. Khrushchev, I wonder if you could tell us the contents of your message to the Soviet Premier and what the thinking was behind this message at this time. Well, I would think that it uh, would be more properly uh, a matter that uh, would uh, best uh, be left to uh, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Khrushchev. It is a letter to me, and I think it would be un discourteous and unwise uh, to uh, reveal such a letter without any indication that it's been received and some response given. As far as the purpose of the letter, the purpose of the letter was to give, uh, in general, uh, some of my views on the questions which uh, are at issue uh, now around the world, and also to indicate my strong confidence in Ambassador Thompson to speak for me and for uh, our country at this time and any discussions you might, might have with Mr. Khrushchev. Mr. President, back on the subject of education, there has been rising speculation that the openly developing fights over the issues of segregation and religion as they are involved in the legislation, uh, may well stop them before they start. Uh, how do you assess the possible damage uh, of those issues as pertaining to your legislation on building schools and loans to teachers' salaries, and do you intend to carry the issue more strongly to the public directly? Well, this matter, of course, uh, these two and, of course, other groups who are opposed to any action in this area have all uh, contributed to the fact that in spite of that this matter has been debated for a number of years, passed the Senate at least two or three times, that uh, we've never gotten legislation. So that obviously it uh, is going to be a difficult matter to secure the passage of legislation this year. But uh, I do not re think that there's anything more important than uh, to have uh, good schools, well-trained, competent teachers. Uh, the, uh, when the Massachusetts Bay Colony was established, one of the first acts that were taken was the establishment of a public school. The Northwest Ordinance, the land-grant colleges, all indicate the long traditional interest which our government and people have had in strengthening our education. We are as good in a long-range sense as our schools are. And therefore, I am extremely interested in seeing the country this year place additional emphasis upon education, additional support to education. In one area alone, as I mentioned uh, some time ago, those people who are first thrown out of work are at the bottom of the educational ladder. The papers are filled with ads requiring scientists, technicians, engineers in the West Coast and all across the country. People who can't find jobs are people who uh, were not uh, well educated at the beginning. I think everyone should have a cha maximum chance to develop his talents. I do not believe that that can be done effectively without passage of this bill this year. I'm therefore hopeful that however strong the feelings may run, and I'm very conscious of them, on all these other matters, that the program of scholarships for college students, of loans to colleges, because we're going to have to double the number of children, we're going to have double the number of children in 1970 that we do today applying for admission to our colleges, and grants for public schools, I'm hopeful that that will be passed this year. President, in order to avoid another snafu, as the one that had involved the 45 pieces of ball-bearing machinery that were originally scheduled to go to Russia, what instructions have you issued to the Department of Defense and Commerce regarding export license for American manufacturers to uh, Iron Curtain Company? I'm hopeful the procedures can uh, be improved. There was a difference of opinion between the Commerce Department and the Defense Department, and there was a difference in emphasis in the Defense Department's position over a period of time. So they did take the view from the beginning that it was uh, not in the national interest. It has uh, been, um, I think, uh, quite unfortunate the way it was handled. I'm hopeful in the future that we can set up better procedures so that a better judgment can be made. But I must say that it's extremely difficult for those who are making the judgment. Caution tells them to send nothing. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, on the other hand, we're anxious to uh, permit uh, some degree of trade which does not uh, weaken our security or increase our danger to be carried on with countries. After all, uh, countries in Western Europe are carrying on very intensive trade with the Soviet Union, and some countries with uh, communist China, so that uh, what they cannot get here, they get there. 
So we wish to bring some reason to it, but it is a difficult matter. But after this experience, which has been uh, not wholly satisfactory, and Governor Hodges is giving this matter close attention with Secretary McNamara and see if we can improve our procedures. This was not uh, the best example of government in action. Mr. President, Mr. President, I have a two-part question on the RB47 quiet. Uh, first, uh, could you tell us now where and uh, when and under what circumstances the flyers were shot down, and second, are such flights being continued? The, uh, I think the flyers uh, discussed the matter uh, quite fully with uh, the press uh, last Friday. Uh, Mr. President, in connection with the trade, some uh, domestic groups, in including uh, labor unions, are uh, turning to economic boycotts as uh, their answer to import competition. I wonder if you could state your position on this approach to uh, international trade uh, difficulties. Well, I'm hopeful that uh, those uh, boycotts will not uh, spread. It's not the Congress has set up certain procedures by which uh, those uh, industries are hard hit. Uh, they can protect themselves. Uh, the peril point, the escape clause, the procedures before the Tariff Commission. Congress is uh, going to have an opportunity to uh, consider the whole matter of uh, reciprocal trade, I believe, next year. And uh, to, uh, I'm recognized that these workers are hard hit, but uh, then we're not able to, they're not always able to make a judgment of what the total uh, national uh, uh, need is and also uh, the need, international need. I have seen some cases where boycotts have been suggested where the percentage of imports is, uh, is fractional compared to the domestic market, one or two percent. Well, now, if uh, we're not going to follow the procedures set down by the American people acting through their Congress, but instead every group is going to take it into their own hands, then, of course, uh, we're going to have action taken against us in those countries. We send abroad a good deal of uh, important goods that employ hundreds of thousands and millions of people. And as I have suggested before, the balance of trade has been in our favor by four or five billion dollars. Two can play this game. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, unions in other countries can refuse to unload our goods. And uh, pretty soon we'll find ourselves with an a, a, uh, exacerbated situation among friendly nations and also uh, which will be uh, harmful to uh, the gold flow. Mr. President, uh, could you give us uh, uh, your, your thinking on the problem of communist China in view of the latest word from the Warsaw negotiations? That is, that uh, the Chinese will not consider the admittance of the uh, 32 American correspondents, and they will not uh, consider the release of the prisoners. Uh, I believe there was some hope that uh, if we could exchange correspondence with the Chinese, that it might be a step toward more harmonious relations. Well, that was our hope. and. Uh, they are unwilling to do that. Of course, that hope has been uh, dimmed. They have been, as I, we know, extremely belligerent towards us, and uh, they've been uh, unfailing in their attacks upon the United States and upon. Uh, but of course, I think part of that has been because uh, they recognize that the United States is a uh, committed to the defense and committed to maintaining its. Uh, uh, connections with other countries and committed to its own defense and the defense of freedom. But they have been extremely harsh in their attacks upon us, and uh, uh, I would like to see a uh, lessening of that uh, tension. That is our hope in the beginning. But uh, we're not prepared to uh, surrender in order to get a relaxation of tension. Mr. Smith? Mr. President? I'm sorry. Uh, during the uh, debate on the Meriwether nomination, Senator Morris raised some questions about whether this uh, <coughs> nominee had a police record. He said that you had sent up to, the, to see him, one of your legislative aides, who had read certain notes from the FBI file. I wonder if you could enlighten us as to what are the facts as far as this. Mr. I informed the uh, conference and the Senate that I looked over Mr. Merriweather's FBI record that, uh, before I sent it to the Senate. Mr. Merriweather is now a member of the Export-Import Bank confirmed by the Senate, by a rather large uh, figure, and I'm confident that he'll do a good job. Uh, could you regard to the Peace Corps, uh, to, uh, to do away with the objection of some countries which may not welcome American Corps, and the suggestion has been made that you propose a United Nations Corps of which the American Corps would be a part. Do you have a comment well, on I that? I think that that could, 
usually be considered. It's not intended that any member of the American Peace Corps would go to any country that where he was not warmly welcomed. In addition, as I've said from the beginning, we are putting our major emphasis at the beginning on uh, teachers. And uh, I'm hopeful that those countries which are interested in uh, the uh, understanding uh, our country and our traditions uh, will welcome these young men and women. But they will be sent only where they're welcome and uh, I would certainly feel that uh, we should consider with the United Nations how we can uh, bring our uh, programs into harmony. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir.